Christmas time, and ends up, but somehow I ended up in two at, by mistake. So now I have one at the office and one at home. So it actually works out pretty well. Um, so my talk, so my talk is titled "Language as Synesthesia." Uh, I guess it's a, a little bit more theoretical and a lot more linguistic than you know some of the other things. Um, so I sort of made it so it's accessible to those of you who don't have a huge formal background. Um, if anyone else is interested, you can ask. Uh, and I guess Shannon has sort of heard some of this before because prelim. it's it's a, yeah the prelim. So, um, but it sounds better now. Synesthesia. That's everyone loves that. Um, so uh, language is synesthesia. Um, so just a, a brief like construal of the field up to this point of linguistics, right? Uh, so classic generative grammar began as sort of a formal analysis of language, working in sort of these phrase structure rules that were sort of like a post system, right? So you have a formal system that generates, uh, you know, structures that are accessible, um, you know, syntactic structures, and this is where the generativity of language comes from or whatever. Um, so there's a modular view of language, uh, and the goal implicit in this is to understand what universal grammar is. Universal grammar meaning whatever traits exist in language that are not built you know, from other cognitive faculties. Uh, so more recently, there's a, an often quoted article by Hauser, Chomsky, and Fis, Fitch on language acquisition, or language evolution, excuse me. Uh, I'm talking about the acquisition, prime me. Um, but uh, which coins the term the faculty of language in the broad sense, and that means everything about cognitive life that plays into language as opposed to the faculty of language in the narrow sense, uh, which is whatever that, uh, you know, universal grammar is, whatever that, um, you know, little piece that makes human language distinct. For them, it's merge, but we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, so the field during the 70s and 80s, of course, uh, you had this proliferation of constraints and stipulations and, uh, you know, syntax discovered all these little things, presumably in universal grammar, that made sort of th syntactic theorizing a little messy because you had all these different stipulations and, you know, things that weren't necessarily ba based in any other factor. Um, so during the 90s, uh, the minimalist program arose and the idea behind it was taking the sort of uh, syntactic traits of language and, of course, uh, explaining them in terms of either uh, external factors, external like uh, the interface, different interfaces like prosody or uh, phonology or semantics, uh, or what Chomsky 2005 calls third factor. Uh, and third factor is meant to be, so there's nature and there's nurture and there's third factor. Third factor is supposed to be things like laws of form, uh, you know, sort of well-formedness in general or sometimes complex interactions between the other two uh, factors. Um, so UG in this idea uh, is, should be minimal, it should be something that's highly accessible as opposed to just coining a bunch of uh, formal traits you think are in UG. Now, as a parallel to that, phonology developed in a, a somewhat different way. Um, of course, classically, phonology was sort of rule-based in the same way. You had the uh, sound pattern of English and all these uh, kind of attempts that made, you know, more or less rule-based analysis of language. Uh, but in the early 1990s, this changed. Uh, Paul Smolinski sort of came to the field in indirect, an indirect way and wrote. Uh, he was sort of coming from a connectionist background or... Uh, you know, his general idea is that you don't need these kind of rules. What you can do, is, you know, to account for phonological variation is just have constraints. Uh, and, you know, the constraints take care of themselves in a neural net. You don't actually have to posit any of this uh, UG stuff. You don't actually need it. You don't need, you know, different rules. You can just have optimality. Uh, and that's, that of course gave roads to the optima optimality theory, which is pretty common in phonology now. Um, so originally the idea was like the, the constraints that define phonology are sort of in universal grammar in some ways, uh, but most recently people have actually tried to word those constraints in terms of, uh, I explicitly in terms of like external effects. So for example, there are phonological constraints like, it, you know, it's hard to say voiceless sounds and voiced sounds in sequence. It's hard to modulate your voice back and voice, voicing, not voicing, voicing, not voicing. So these things fall out from some kind of physicality about how the mouth is constructed. And presumably all, all of these constraints aren't necessarily in universal grammar. They fall out from uh, you know, the, the actual reality of speech or something like that. Uh, and the goal is sort of that you know, we don't want phonology to exist as a sort of thing as itself. Uh, that is, all of the traits of phonology actually come from uh, you know, these external factors. Um, now, for some reasons, this minimalism isn't as possible in traditional generative grammar. Uh, now, minimalism is the goal, but there are some, I guess, sort of uh, holdovers that we have from 
I sort of an earlier time. Uh, traditionally, there's the idea that the syntactic engine produces strings uh, or you know structures, and they're interpreted on two interfaces: the phonological interface and the semantic interface. Um, so the syntax now this is sort of a problem because the the syntactic engine. Uh, in a way, is sort of blind to these interfaces. They come, you know, after syntax does its thing. Um, so, what, if you want to like have merge, or you want to have syntax, you know, have these truly minimal structures that, you know, only work in terms of external constraints, merge sort of has to have the answers written on the back of its hand. It has to know I can put this here, I can put that there, and the way of implementing this is sort of by putting all the answers in the lexicon. Uh, that is, you say, you know. For example, English is a VO language because there is some kind of head feature, you know, abstract head feature that always wants, you know, uh, you know, an object on this particular side or, or something like that. Um, so it's, I think it's kind of cheating, frankly. Um, but anyway, I'll sort of uh, show you my alternative. Um, so the minimalist ideal in syntax, uh, regardless, is a theory where the narrow language faculty is something small or maybe even nothing, maybe something that is sort of epiphenomenal. Uh, and the language faculty can see all interface constraints simultaneously, so you, it, is a, it can look at phonology, it can look at semantics, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and the actual mechanism of the narrow language faculty is at home in general cognitive architecture. So all the complexities, if you want a truly minimal system, you want the complexities of language to be dealt with in terms of other cognitive apparatuses or whatever, however, whatever the plural, that word you want to have. Uh, and of course it has to be interesting because otherwise uh, I wouldn't be interested. Um, so synesthesia, so I assume most people uh, you know, know what synesthesia is, but in case you don't, it's a kind of mental condition where you might see uh, a smell or like smell a shape. Uh, you sort of, it's a crossing of different media of sensory, you know, in your sensory motor system. So you know, a lot of people see colors and numbers and they can, uh, whenever they see a number, it appears as some particular color or something like that. Um, so in some extreme situations, whole mental faculties seem to merge with each other. So take the example of Daniel Tammet. Um, he's a, uh, actually an autistic savant. He, he sort of became famous when the BBC did a documentary on him a couple, maybe a decade ago or something. Uh, but he's capable of doing these cra crazy calculations. You just give him numbers and he'll divide them, multiply them, whatever you want. He can count pi to like 10,000 digits or something. Um, and he actually reports this as being sort of, uh, this is a kind of synesthesia. Uh, most autistic savants can't report this, but he's very high functioning so he can do this. And he says what happens when he, he is doing math is that he sees each number as a kind of object with like a, a color, a shape, and when he's doing math with those, uh, those you know, numbers, they physically move together and you know, they, they combine to make this new number. Uh, so what seems to happen is that, uh, I put too many words on this slide because you can't see them, but what seems to happen is his spatial reasoning, you know, his, uh, the human ability for spatial reasoning, which by all account is pretty good, uh, has been sort of co-opted to do this other thing like numeracy. Um, so that, that's sort of what I'm getting at here. So when I say language is synesthesia, I'm saying that language results not from a new operation, so not something like merge or set forming formation like Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch uh, proposed, but as a kind of synesthesia between two interfaces. Uh, that is the motor system, uh, the thing that, you know, pr you pronounce things that has all the prosodic phonological constraints because you're externalizing it, uh, and the conceptual intentional system, and that really just means semantic, semantics, your semantic processing, uh, stuff like this. Um, so in other animals, these are distinct cognitive systems that have evolved and they do their own things, but humans have this distinct ability to apply categories of one system onto the other and back. Um, so while most of the conceptual intentional system is non-conscious, uh, if it's mixed with the motor system in this way, effectively what happens is that humans in by language, by this kind of synesthesia, we can externalize these interior thoughts uh, in a way not just to other people but sort of to ourselves, like they make them aware to our conscious mind. Um, so the claim just in general is like humans are basically high functioning autistic savant apes. Okay? Uh, instead of smelling colors, our motor system uh, spills and you know spills out uh, our ideas and our ideas you know can be processed uh, you know in our sensory motor system. Uh, and like synesthesia, you don't have a choice, right? I think we, we were talking about a couple weeks ago, you can't not interpret English when you hear it. You can't not interpret whatever language you hear. It just has to happen. Same thing with people who have synesthesia. If you see a five, 
and you perceive fives as red, you're going to see five. Five seems like a very red number to me. I don't know. I don't have synesthesia, but um, so there's no need for a, a formal op like a, a narrow language faculty per se. You don't need an extra operation. Uh, it, it, so it's not so much minimalism. It's sort of nihilism. You don't have a new operation. You just have uh, different faculties uh, merging. Um, so. But of course, synesthesia or whatever, you know, your brain has a sort of trial to overcome in a way. That is, the motor system and the conceptual and intentional system are formally different. Um, so their differences are mediate and presumably their differences mediated by, uh, you know, general cognitive architecture. I'll get into that. Similar to optimality theory and phonology. Um, so just in general, uh, you know, when you're looking at semantic structure, or you're, when you're looking at the structures, it's generated by merge. I'm, I don't necessarily uh, yield much credence to that, but when you're thinking about this, um, you know, the, the structure of semantics is more or less binary, and it can go infinitely deep. So you can have sentences and sentences and sentences, that's totally fine. Uh, even when you look at distributed morphology or cartography or something like this, so this is the kind of structure you find very deep structures with different meanings, and uh, you know, so you have stuff like this. So semantic structure tends to be binary and very deep. But when you actually externalize things, um, it has to be a little different. Um, that is, when you externalize things, the, the formal structure has to be bushy, right? So you can't go infinitely deep, you can't go very wide, but you have, for example, the U is an utterance, IP is an intonational phrase, the phi is like a phonological phrase. These are all different modulations uh, that you have in actual speech, and you have to put them in not necessarily this infinitely embedded situation, but you have to put them sort of you know, uh, right next to each other at an equal situation. So what the language faculty has to do is it takes the two formal structures that these different systems have and it has to sort of optimize uh, given the constraints of both. Um, so you can see a lot of this, what you have is a kind of matching or uh, grafting in this. Uh, so a common example is extraposition in different language. This is, is uh, German, of course, so the sentence is Ich will wissen, was Liebe ist. I want to know what love is. Um, so the structure on the left is actually consistent with normal uh, German uh, word order. So you usually put the objects right before the verb, so the verb is wissen, and here the object is was liebe ist. You you'd expect it to be like on the left. Uh, but in reality, this, when the object is something that has to, pr is something phonologically really heavy, some kind of CP, some kind of uh, phrase, what actually has to happen it has, is it has to appear at the end of the sentence. And if you think about this in terms of phonological constraints, it actually makes lots of sense. Really, you're just trying to graft particular uh, phrases onto particular, particular phonological phrases. And sometimes that requires you to move things around from the order you might think is normal. Um, it actually happens in English as well. So we have usually put adjectives before the no noun, the excited man. But if you want to say excited for the future, that's you know its own little phrase in itself. You can't say the excited for the future man. Uh, that doesn't really sound right. So you say, the man excited for the future. And those are two distinct phonological phrases. And this is something that happens, of course, all the time. It's, you know, don't even notice it. Um, so now if, for example, language is doing this and is just optimizing with two different structures, uh, in phonology, of course, when you look at language differences, the differences is what languages prioritize what constraints. Uh, so presumably, if that is true in phonology, it should be true in syntactic variation, uh, because ultimately we're just motivating it in terms of phonology. Um, so traditionally, ch children were thought of as learning syntactic parameters when they're children. So you learn if your language has verbs before objects or objects before verbs or something like this. Um, but if the traits of syntax fall out from prosody or some kind of interface constraint, uh, the syntactic parameters shouldn't really be syntactic parameters. They should really, you should have prosodic parameters and those interact to cause the syntactic parameters. There's nothing that per se that you learn about the syntax of the language. You learn the external constraints, you like prosody, and then the syntax falls out. So what do I mean by that? Um, one of the articles I sent around, I don't know if anyone read it because it's the last week and it was like 40 pages, but uh, what it was on was uh, you know, the WH parameter. So traditionally you have languages like English that move question words up to the beginning of the sentence. You also have languages like Japanese that keep question words uh, sort of where they semantically belong wherever they are in the sentence. They don't have to be at the beginning. So Richards, and this is the article I sent out, notices that Japanese and English are actually doing the same thing. So if you look at the Japanese sentence in a kind of uh, you know, spectrogram, you, you look at how it's pronounced, uh, you'll see actually that what, when you get to the question word, uh, there's a pitch compression that lasts until the end of the sentence. Uh, 
And what's significant about that is in Japanese, that's where you have complementizers, that's where you have uh, the, the C, the scope of the sentence. Uh, while in English, it's actually on the left, okay? But in Japanese, it's on the right. Uh, yeah? Um, so in this, in this sentence, the, uh, uh, the question particle, ka, is left out. Do you know if, and that, that's totally fine, Yeah. but do you know if the question particle, ka, is left on the end of that sentence, the same thing happens? Uh, I don't know. I don't think his data talked about that. Okay. I, I don't know, and I don't know enough about Japanese to tell you anything. So, um, but the idea is, so when you get to the question word in Japanese, what Japanese speakers do is compress everything from the question word to the C, which is on the right hand, into one phonological phrase. And the, uh, Richard's idea is basically all languages try and do this. They try and minimize the prosodic difference between the question word and where it takes scope in, the, in C. Now in English, where C is on the left, um, now, English and Japanese, I should say, are the same in that they project phonological boundaries on the left side. So Japanese can project, you know, from this uh, phonological boundary and make one big phonological phrase joining all the rest of the sentence. So you're all in one phonological phrase. English can't do that because, uh, again, it, it as well forms boundaries on the left. Uh, but, of course, the C in English is to the, actually to the left as well. So what English does is move uh, the parameter out, or the, the word out. Um, so Richard's account, it's, I'm, I'm not giving it justice, you should take a look at it if you're interested. Um, but basically he makes a whole typology of languages that vary on these two parameters, whether you have a C on the right or the left, and whether you make phonological phrases on the right or the left. And if you look at languages across the world, you actually find out that in each situation, whether or not uh, you have a WH fronting or WH in situ language, um, you, I, it actually simply falls out from the prosodic factors. Uh, of each language and nothing else. So you don't actually need a WH parameter in the classical uh, sense. Uh, and he can even account for some data of WH words actually moving to the right, uh, which you can't necessarily do in traditional. It, it happens in Basque, but it's hard to do in traditional syntax. Um, so word order parameters are sort of the same. Uh, so Kanamuipur notices that, you know, traditional accounts of stress, what happened is you sort of build syntactic structure, and as you build syntactic structure, the phonological rules of the language assign where stress is gonna be based on the structure it's building up, okay? Um, now the problem with that, as Kanamuipur no notices, is that um, this, that might, might be true, but this kind of theory over-generates the kind of languages you actually find in real life. Because theoretically, you could have the stress at any particular uh, place, any particular word. That doesn't actually happen. What actually happens is that languages universally will stress objects over subjects and subjects over verbs. That sentential stress will fall on the object, if not the subject, yada yada. Um, so, uh, so really, the classical theories over-generate this. Um, but if you have sort of the, uh, the perspective of, well, what's really happened is there's simply an optimization going on, uh, what ends up, you can simply say instead of, for example, syntax feeding phonology a string and phonology putting stress in places, uh, you can still instead say, oh, there are prosodic parameters in different languages, and each language will pre place its words in a place such that they re receive the appropriate level of stress. Um, so that's the idea here. And that, oh, of course it went off. The, the one slide where I have my own stuff and it goes off the side. Um, but this is an implementation of this in optimality theory. If you don't know what this is, this is, it's fine. Um, but on the left, these are all different potential word orders uh, and phonological phrase parsings. Uh, and up here, you have different constraints. So for example, ta this is, there are processing constraints. There are uh, you know, phon phonological constraints. So for example, topics should tend to come before um, you know, non-topics like subjects before objects, you should have trochaic stress, you should have iambic stress, stuff like that. Um, and this part of, is part of my qualifying paper. So if you feed a neural net implemented in, you know, optimality theory, but if you, f the idea is if you feed a neural net these kind of constraints, um, you can actually get the, the word orders for free. You don't have to have separate uh, rules saying that English is an SVO language or something like that. Um, so as a reorientation, that's, I threw a bunch of linguistics at you, um, as a reorientation though. Uh, so linguistic alternations, and this idea should be one, motivatable by external, um, you know, interface constraints like phonology, semantics, stuff like this. Uh, and two, they should be accounted for with general non-UG non specific cognitive architecture. So the idea, and this is something that ideally this does because um, you're, a, you're motivating things by these constraints. And you also are dealing with them in such a way that uses what is modeled as a neural net, which presumably is something similar to what the brain may or may not do, um, 
so you're getting this kind of stuff for free, um, is the idea. So data like the previous, uh, previous are examples of both, and you, again, this is a very minimalist uh, interpretation of both. Uh, so we've, I've described language as synesthesia, but what does this actually mean for human cognitive life um, outside of linguistics? Um, so in this perception, right, um, you know, language is kind of making the non-conscious aspect of the, the sensory, or excuse me, the conceptual intentional system uh, conscious um, in that it's spilling it into your sensory motor system. Um, so you, all, all of a sudden, you suddenly become aware of all these different heuristics that your mind had that, you know, weren't necessarily in, in your brain beforehand. You can introspect, you can look at the sentences you're saying and does this actually make sense? You can have multiple sentences sort of in your short time, your short term conscious memory um, and uh, you, you can dwell on thought, memorize things easier, stuff like this. Um, now we can have multiple levels of cognitive, we might have different levels of cognitive processes, some of which are more conscious, some are less. Um, but this kind of synesthesia sort of brings them all to the same level. So you can sort of use them um, you know, for, at, for one end or something like that. Um, so some of, some whys that this may or may not answer, it's your call. Um, so one is why is our conscious perceptive thought in language? So a good question you might ask is, well, in, you know, traditional theories of grammar, you have some kind of language of thought, somehow it gets out and eventually you enunciate it and, you know, whatever parameters of your language, um, and which are mostly based on, you know, these kind of interface constraints, you know, uh, but a, a good question to ask is why, when we're actually thinking in our head, why do we think in English? Why don't we think in some other kind of form of logic? Um, so in a theory like this, the, the answer is, what is happening is not that consciousness is just bubbling up until, you know, it comes from our uncon or excuse me, language thought is not bubbling up from the non-conscious mind into our consciousness, out our mouths or something like that. What actually is happening is that our conscious perceptive language is actually coming from the sensory motor system. So you're actually, uh, you know, because that is the, the sort of interface and you are aware only of the form of language which you externalize and nothing uh, else. So why are humans cognitively distinct from non-human uh, relatives? Uh, so we have similar abilities, but a large portion of our general reasoning abilities are malleable by these levels of higher level cognition. So we can, as I said in the last slide, we, we can double think things, we can evaluate things, we can sort of, you know, although animals might have sort of similar heuristics and biases that we have, um, we can sort of dwell on them and, you know, use them for more, you know, forward thinking or, or, or of course, exchange them. Um, so another question is why do humans acquire language so easily? Uh, well, firstly, uh, they acquire the syntax of the language as early as they hear the prosodic constraints, right? So in this theory, right, when you are learning the prosody of language, you are learning the syntax. When you learn where stress goes in a sentence, you're actually learning also where objects and subjects and stuff like this go. Um, or, you know, a, and of course, by all accounts, you know, prosodic learning starts extremely early, possibly even in utero, so, you know, babies, you know, still unborn might know if their languages are WH fronting or not, but that's just the possibility. Um, so that's one thing speeding up acquisition because there is really no syntactic acquisition, it's just prosodic acquisition. Uh, secondly, languages are, are, end up being local maxima of prosodic optimization. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you imagine, if you imagine, well, I can actually draw this. Um, yeah, I don't have enough board room, I'll just do it here. Um, so if you imagine, let's say we have n-dimensional space. Okay, say this is like, this is two dimensions, but imagine it is like n-dimensional space. Though. There's dimension one, there's dimension two, okay? Uh, and these two dimensions are like the rank, the importance of a particular prosodic constraint or something like that. So these are two, imagine infinity of them or however many there are. Uh, so on this, we have sort of uh, topology of, you know, there are different lumps. And these are lumps of prosodic well-formedness, right? So the higher the lump, that's the prosodically better, uh, you know, a particular setting of constraints is, okay? Um, so in a theory like this, uh, since you have all of these different prosodic constraints that work together, they converge on sort of an optimal solution. And Richard gets at this, like, you know, English's WH fronting comes from the other parameters of the language. Uh, if we were, basically every language is a Pareto optimal solution to different constraints. If you change any of them, they get worse. So we're all sort of local maxima. Uh, so at every point here, it, 
of you know all the possible languages you can theoretically have. Each of these points is like a language that could actually exist in real life. So if you're acquiring a language and you hear data that's consistent with, let's say, a point here, um, well, you now know that if you want to get to a pr you know the local maximum or whatever, you actually move up here. You say, okay, I've heard data consistent with this language, uh, but this language is a local maxima. I'm going to you know, that, that's probably what I'm actually hearing. Uh, so you, with this kind of algor algorithm for children to acquire, uh, you know, prosodically well-formed languages, you actually ease the sort of acquisition of how this happens. Um, and of course, this, again, would happen for gajillion parameters, not just two, so it wouldn't just be, um, you know, that level. Um, so what else? Uh, and another thing I guess I was sort of thinking about at the last minute is, you know, how does this compare to... Uh, what Tom has been mentioning about, uh, you know, Natasha's work about how we, you know, can hear partial sentences and, you know, don't understand anything. Uh, I think there might be an answer even for that here uh, in that, um, I mean, if you think about synesthesia, so if you, let's say, you know, you have synesthesia and you see a five, right? And let's say five feels green to you, just because green is the, the letter uh, or the color I had. Um, now, if you see half of a five, it's not like, um, it's not like you're going to, see half green or something like that. It has to be totally categorical. Um, so what, what is actually happening when we're processing language is not so much we are hearing things, our conscious mind is hearing things bit by bit and we're interpreting them. Rather, uh, the sensory motor system, which is sort of you know, figuring these things out for us, will either send us sort of a full five, giving us the, you know, sin, uh, you know, the, the percept of greenness or the percept of meaning, uh, but if it sends us half of that, well, then that doesn't mean anything. It wasn't interpreted in, interpreted in the sensory motor system, so it doesn't mean anything. Um, so that, that's, I don't know, does that make sense when I'm getting there? Okay. It's just categorical processing, right? Is the way to say yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's supposed to be categorical. So in order, if, you know, if the sensory motor system sends you partial data, uh, then that doesn't mean anything. Because the idea is basically you're not doing the processing in your conscious mind. It happens in this optimization between, you know, the sensory motor system and the conceptual intentional system. Um, the, oh. the synesthesia idea is really cool because it actually does match the anatomy. Oh, yeah. The stuff I was talking about with that, um, yeah. that, that parrot paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is there aspect of the um, There being deeper connections literally between the auditory and sensory motor regions of the mind. That's one of the genetic precursors of language. So as opposed to other animals? Yeah, that's, that's okay. common okay. only to those vocal learning birds and humans. Hmm. Um, so that goes in line with it, I think. Okay. Did you, uh, did you have like a handout that you gave out? No, um, but it's just the name Eric Jarvis. Okay. So it's all his research. Okay. So that's, yeah. I'll check that out. Yeah, he'd probably be happy to hear about this. Hmm. Oh, okay. Where is he? You know? Um, I do not remember. Okay. All right, so some conclusions or sort of restatements. Uh, so the idea is language arose in humans not as a new uh, mental operation like merge that, you know, that's com uh, uh, common in Hauser and all, uh, but really a merger of two different systems that's, you know, likable to synesthesia. Uh, so consistent with minimalist principles, uh, linguistic variation does happen at the interfaces, not necessarily in the, the traditional way, um, but what is effectively happening is that when you learn, well, you don't learn the syntax of a language. You learn the constraints, what is important in your language, uh, you know, in prosody and things like this, and the syntax sort of falls out from that. Um, so the, the cognitive good of language is that you are made aware of all these like lower level processes in your brain and you can think about them, uh, well I listed them out again, right, so you can introspect, second guess, uh, easier to memorize, stuff like that. Um, and the idea of merge and the, the narrow language faculty isn't, necess isn't a necessity. You don't have to think that there's an actual, um, you know, e evolution in a lot of ways, you know, pro progresses by repurposing uh, and changing old machinery, not, not necessarily making these new operations. Um, and it also allows you to say, uh, the other article I sent out, the Gallistel article, is of course on uh, some of the cognitive properties that are attributed to merge or the language faculty are actually present in animals. And you can actually, this is consistent with that data, you can say that animals do have uh, 
you know, numeracy and dyxis and some of the other things that Gallus Lowell talks about. It's just that they don't have the, you know, they can employ it at the level we can because they don't have this synesthesia that brings it to consciousness. Um, so I think that, yeah, so uh, that's it. So anyone have any questions, comments? Everybody took a deep breath. <laughs> so, it seems that you need to address certain kinds of phenomena that are not obviously related to the phrasing, let's say, or I mean, you talk about it in terms of um, intonation, you might be mapping that or somebody might map that onto uh, claims about phases. Yeah. Uh, but how in this way of thinking do you handle constraints on anaphores? So whatever it's called, principle C, uh, that uh, certain kinds of anaphores are bound in their own clause, let's say, and certain are unbound. Uh, well, I think there are different you send it like you're going to continue. Um, well, I think there are different ways of dealing with it. Um, one is that, well, there's the possibility that in the conceptual system, uh, you know, something like an anaphor and something like a pronominal are just different things, and they're reflected in language like that. Now, that's sort of a cop-out, um, but I think also I, I'm not necessarily, I don't lend too much credence to a lot of the things about the different principles just because um, a lot of them are sensitive to things like linear order in certain situations, and a lot of them, uh, you know, there, there's sort of variation at the edges. Um, now that said, there I'm I'm fully. I guess my perspective is there are some things that I can't explain, including, for example, the difference between raising and control, or something like that. Maybe. Um, so there are some things that traditional generative grammar does really well, um, and I'm not necessarily taking those things on. Uh, I'm just sort of leaving them, focusing on the things I want. So. Uh, I'm basically saying I don't have a good answer, if that's what you're looking for. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> but uh, but if, you, if you're viewing this as a project, yeah. then these are the kinds of things you need to integrate yeah. uh, uh, with the, the kernel view that you have at the moment, the mm -hmm. intonational phase two. Right. Um, does every language have an intonation pattern that satisfies the criteria that you need? Well, their intonational patterns are different, but I mean, they all, I mean, what are you getting at there? I don't know, because I don't know enough about the different languages. But What's are you asking if they're all like local maxima that thing you were drawing? Well, that would be one question, sure. Well, I would, I would say, I would, you know, assert without sufficient evidence, I'd probably say that that's the case. And that is, no language could be prosodically improved in general by changing one parameter or something like that. Now, I guess another question would be, are, you know, there's been much research on uh, artificial languages. Can people learn languages that are violate UG in traditional terms? Uh, one question would be, can you teach in a laboratory setting someone a uh, prosodically poorly formed language. That's a question. Might be a, a way of pursuing this kind of stuff, but um, I, I think in general, implicit here is I, I would claim that yes, I think that all languages, in some sense, all languages that actually exist, exist in, in the world are, in some, some, you know, prosodically optimal for their, you know, local maxima. Um, but different ways of assessing that. I was going to ask. Uh, <laughs> I just don't know. What about ASL? Like, what's the intonation pattern or stress pattern there? I, I'm just ignorant of it. Well, I mean, I, I can't tell you specifically about it, but I guess my theory would sort of predict that in the same way that there are, you know, constraints to spoken languages, there are constraints to how you contort your hands, things like this, and presumably languages that are built on different media might not necessarily share exactly the same kind of you know, you know, in different modalities, you might have different constraints, and you might expect languages to look totally differently in formal terms. Um, now, I don't know enough about signed languages to 
opine on that, um, but that certainly something I sort of want to know. That could be a, a kind of critical case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To show that the uh, haptic and arm constraints <laughs> lead to different expressions of intonation. Yeah. But I don't know what would you make of that. Where, where are the connections? Sorry, where is the explanation based on connections between auditory and uh, motor uh, systems go? If you're talking about, you're not, no longer talking about auditory. Yeah. Well, I honestly, I frankly don't know enough about sign languages to even know how to validate them. So I don't. I'm not really sure. I mean, I guess, well, if I make some sort of drastic claim about why something happens in spoken language for, I mean, for WH fronting, right? So Richard's claim about, you know, mo uh, minimizing prosodic differences. Um, is there some corollary of that in sign languages? Uh, if there's not, maybe, uh, you know, it's something modality dependent. If it is, maybe either the theory is wrong or, it is, there's something deeper than even the, I mean, for example, one, one example I was thinking about is uh, constituency, right? So uh, you might want to put things in, well, let me zoom back. So you might want to put, uh, yeah, you might want to put, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, phrases in this kind of constituency because, oh, it's prosodically well-formed. Uh, and it's nice to have phonological phrase, phonological phrase, phonological phrase, uh, and nothing else. Uh, but it could also be something like just general processing, right? So it, it's easier to process things in chunks, and the phonology is just epiphenomenal. The fact that we put them in prosodic phrases or something. Um, so I guess there are a lot of different ways to interpret it, and I, I don't know within the case of sign language where that would lead. Can you go back to your chart, the optimality chart? Right. Uh, where was that? Right. So you've heard um, Dave Madero's yeah. go on and on about a particular word order that just never is attested. That's right. Is that one up there? Um, well, I will say, so I have a typology of this. This chart is not actually complete. Um, I ran, I should have mentioned this, but I ran, you know, certain constraints uh, in the ground, like, and ran them through a program that gives you a typology of what languages can occur. And my answer, my theory is actually more restrictive than Dave. Uh, so I actually rule out, I think, the um, OSV, which is the one he rules out, and also I think OVS, one of the other object initial languages. I think it's, so I have all the subject before vo uh, object languages, and I think also VOS is possible. Um, now, I could rejigger the constraints and get things differently, um, but as uh, my theory right here predicts, you know, four per partic particular word orders, and that's something like 99% of languages, so I just sort of left it there. So would OSV just be blocked by it's a, a myriad of constraints in this way of doing it? Yeah, ba basically. Um, and it, it's weird how this actually works out. Um, uh, so one of the constraints that, you know, at least counts against it is topic first, which of course wants subject before objects. Um, that actually doesn't, although if you get rid of that, you actually get basically the same grammar. It's really strange how it works. What actually happens is you get more, I think, VSO grammars. It's something really weird. Um, but yeah, it's really just a conspiracy of constraints. None of them say, of course, you know, star 213, um, but they sort of incidentally rule that out in similar word orders. So that, so the brackets are supposed to be like phonological phrases. So for example, um, uh, phonological phrase. So for example, an A, that's like the subject's in one phonological phrase, V, O is in another phonological phrase, as opposed to like D, where the subject and the verb would be in one phonological phrase. That, sorry, if you're not clear from that before. Um, so I'm pretty ha this is my qualifying paper on sort of, um, or this chart is sort of a part of that. So I'm happy with the results there at least. Um, and yeah, any other comments? That's very nice. Okay. Yeah, All right, thanks. Okay.
All right, that's it for this year. <laughs> <laughs> yep.